Welcome back to another webinar organized by Princeton University's BCF. Today, we are happy to have Michael Spence with us. Hi, Michael. Michael will talk about tracking the global pandemic economy at a global scale. We're very happy to have him with us. As usual, I will talk about uh, last Monday's talk, the last talk orga uh, organized by Princeton's BCF. Arvin Krishnamurti was talking about corporate debt overhang problems and how credit policy can actually mitigate or might even worsen corporate debt overhang problems. Today, uh, Mike Spence will talk about tracking the global economy, which relates to earlier talks we had by Gita Gobinat. She also focused very much on the global aspects, showed a lot of charts, and also the difference between service and non-service uh, economy-related settings. And that was really um, one talk which is closely related to today's talk. On top of it, the component today which tracks in real time what's going on uh, is close to Raj Chetty's talk, who focused much more on the US economy and tracking in real time economic data in the United States. Eric Hurst was also focusing on the US economy, more from the unemployment side. He was covering one sixth of the workforce in the United States on uh, payroll data. So all of them together with today's talk give a nice bundle of um, tracking the real economy at the US and global setting. Then on Friday, Bob Schiller will talk about narrative economics and the COVID crisis. He will relate also to other historical episodes and how the narrative, which is spun by the governments and other economic actors, plays out and makes a huge difference how to recover and how the economy will be seen in the long run. Now, one of the messages which came out of Tyler Cohen's earlier webinar is that we, the COVID crisis is speeding up existing trends. So we have certain trends like this bicycle rider going down the hill, but the COVID crisis essentially just makes the bicycle go down all the way immediately rather than going along about existing trend. There might be one exception, which is the sharing economy. We might not want to share uh, cars or other components like housing, Airbnb, and other companies. That might be one exception, but for many, many other dimensions, the COVID crisis is actually speeding up existing trends. We've had already a deglobalization going on. This might be sped up, or many, many other dimensions, and Mike will refer to this as well. Now, in, with regard to looking at data, at real-time data, there's an evolution going on in macroeconomics. Traditionally, we looked at uh, the past data, and we often had it only that um, quarterly or annually or monthly frequency and try to predict what uh, to forecast what's going on in the future. On top of it, there's a huge literature evolving now on now casting just to understand the current circumstances better in order to take current policy actions. The literature went beyond that and also focused on the cross section, so many, many time series in order to improve the now casting and also the forecasting. But the challenge we face now is that we have actually a structural break. Everything is different because of the structural break. We have not experienced a pandemic for a long, long time. The modern economy we are having now, we don't have seen a structural break like that. And that makes it very hard to predict. So we really have to understand what's going on right away. And for this actually high frequency, real-time data is very beneficial. And that's also what Raj Chetty and Eric Hurst ex are exploring at the national level. And here um, we will learn more about uh, real-time data at the global scale. And of course, we need some models to project from this high frequency data to the longer run implications. For this, we need structural models to understand that. One interesting perspective you might get is to highlight the importance of the change in the economy is the change we have experienced in digitalization. So let's suppose you hypothetically ask the COVID crisis would have occurred in 1995. What would have happened before the internet was essentially born or developed, the internet economy uh, developed? 
What would have happened if we had in 1995 a COVID crisis? We had less in time tracking of economic data. We probably would rely much more on face masks, which give you more privacy and less on tracing uh, apps on the iPhone and other mobile smartphones, which give you less privacy. So there would be different circumstances how to handle this. And the question would be, if we were in 1995, would the recession be sharper and deeper? And would it be also more long lasting because there would be more long term scarring effects and very long lasting negative effects? Or could it also be that right now uh, there's also the long lasting positive effects, which are much more pronounced currently than it would have been in 1995 because we have now all the possibilities to switch over to telemedicine into home office activities, we go to online learning. So many universities, Princeton and others, are going to online learning and online conferences. And we have our webinar and Zoom webinars are going on. And these long lasting effects are coming now because the technology is ready and would have not come online in 1995 already. So these are interesting questions. They are more speculative, but to get a perspective along that. So along the time dimension, uh, what we also would like to look at, I'll look in the cross section across countries. And the question is to what extent can we learn from various country experiences during the COVID crisis? Economists have studied cross country regressions in order to understand GDP growth rate and GDP levels for a long, long time and are quite critical that cross country regressions give you a lot of insights. There are a lot of uh, challenges to overcome. And one of them is, of course, data might be not comparable. In the health dimension, it might be that testing levels are very different, and hence, it, you know, discovering more of a large fraction of population having COVID is not the same in a country where there's a lot of testing compared to a country where there's very little testing. There might be no honesty in reporting the data. Governments might have incentive to distort the data. And there might be just different policies leading to different data. And that's what we have seen in Eric Hur's presentation. US unemployment is very, very high because in order to get the benefits to a large extent, you have to be unemployed. While in Europe, the unemployment rates did not spike up to the same level by a large margin, because in order to get the benefits from the government, you have to stay employed and you go to short-term work or Kurzarbeit, as it is called in Germany. There might be also different data with respect, you know, how you measure whether somebody dies on or with COVID. So many countries might not use the same uh, data. So it's very important that internationally we standardize the data, correct for these policy specific uh, corrections and share the data timely. On, in addition to this, of course, there's huge cultural differences. Uh, you know, in Japan, for example, uh, tradition to follow the rules is very uh, pronounced there. People wear masks for in, all over Asia anyway, so for a long time. And even if that, then it depends who is doing the data analysis. And there's famous quotes by former British Prime Ministers, Benjamin Disraeli, who said there are three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. And Winston Churchill famously said, the only statistics that you can trust is the one you falsify yourself. Uh, I would not go so far. I think statistics is an extremely useful tool and new methods, machine learning methods and traditional econometrics and also are a very useful tool, but we have to be aware of the shortfalls and the shortcomings uh, from these data and we have to treat it with cautions. Now, once you compare the countries, across countries, then the other question is to what extent we are compared across social orders, across systems, and I took two extremes here, going back to my introduction from uh, Tyler Cohen's talk. You can have an authoritarian regime. Here I put uh, Joseph Stalin as one representative of an authoritarian regime with a lot of surveillance, which allows to better internalize externalities. And you have incentives as a stick. You internalize and enforce uh, any rules you have. Or you can have a more open society. And I put a picture of um, uh, F.A. Hayek there, which, you know, uh, grants more privacy, more freedom for individual peoples to decide what to do, 
And the big advantage, of course, is that that leads to better information flow. And we have seen in the early outbreaks of the crisis how important it is that information flow flows out. So both systems have their advantages and disadvantages. Of course, uh, open society uh, is much more desirable uh, to live in and in the long run will uh, perform uh, better. But with huge health externalities, there might be an argument to limit temporarily uh, some um, freedoms like going to the beach, and hanging out closely with others, uh, where the optimal point between this one dimensional uh, line, the authoritarian on this extreme, the total free society on the other extreme, might move the optimal point, the maximum here, utility might be here, or social welfare might be here, and it might go down to a lower level. It's perhaps a little bit too extreme, getting too close to the authoritarian uh, aspects. But the big question is, Will this be temporarily? And there's a temptation by the governments to make it then permanent. And one has to watch out for that. And will we return to the pre-COVID social order? How do we ensure that we return to a more open society uh, down the road? So as usual, I would like to end up with um, a poll question, um, as we have always the case. So the high frequency on time data significantly improve policy response, yes or no, uh, do they reduce the depth of the recession? So if you have on-time high-frequency data, they reduce the depth of the recession and also improve the recovery in the long run. And you can click more than one, it's a multiple choice, so you can click more than one of the three questions. The second question is if you do cross-country comparisons, uh, do, what do we learn from that? What do you think before you hear Mike's presentation? Do you think it shows the importance of the state capacity? Like in Germany, South Korea, Taiwan did fairly well, uh, but there's a state capacity is there. Or it suggests that a temporary larger state involvement is useful. Or do you think it suggests even across countries that you want a permanent overhaul of democracy and the restriction of individual freedoms um, in order to handle the current circumstances and future outbreaks as well. So it should be a permanent rather than only a temporary uh, correction. So I give you a few seconds to respond to this crisis, uh, to this poll questions uh, triggered by the COVID crisis. Okay, so let me just, so 95% think actually that high frequency on-time data significantly improve uh, the policy response. So that's almost 100% um, of the respondees. Again, it can be more than one answer. Uh, reduces the depth of the recession, 42% only think that it reduces the depth of the recession and it improves the recovery, 45%. I think this way. Again, it adds up to more than 100% because um, you could on, pick more than one answer. About the cross country, cross regime uh, comparison, uh, that the current crisis shows the importance of a state capacity. That's 85%, I think that's the case. And it suggests a temporary larger state involvement, 48% think this way. And it suggests even in the long run, you have to rethink some democratic freedoms and individual freedoms. Uh, that's only 22% thing. So the majority thinks state capacity is the key and uh, temporarily we might have even a larger state involvement, but in the long run, uh, only 22% think. So that's been 78% uh, I think then actually, you know, we don't, we want to come back and don't restrict individual freedoms too much. So with this, I stop sharing my screen and pass the screen on to Mike and we are very excited and hope uh, to get all his insights he will tell us today. Uh, looking at global data from a bigger picture perspective. Perfect. So I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got, there we go. How am I doing? Marcus, is this Very up? Very good. I can see it. Okay, good. Well, listen, thank you so much. Um, I, I really appreciate the chance and um, to sort of compare notes. And I think those questions that you posed in your introduction are really interesting. Hopefully this will be um, in some ways responsive to that. So the main part of my talk today is going to be to report on a, um, a project to track what uh, our colleagues in um, China, in Hangzhou, um, call the pandemic uh, global economy. 
pandemic simply means that you know we're we're operating an economy in sort of parallel with the um, with the, the uh, very rapid spread of the virus. And so, what, the goal of this effort, and it's be, the work is being conducted mainly by an academy that was set up uh, roughly two years ago, maybe three, by Jack Ma. It's a t a sort of side by side with Ant Financial and Alibaba, who um, who have a ton of data, at least on the, on the Chinese economy. Marcus and I are both um, members of the academic advisory board to this academy and um, hopefully sometime in the future we'll be able to meet and discuss the research that this academy was set up basically to study the digital economy and to encourage research on it by making the, the very large amount of data that they have access to accessible to scholars uh, essentially everywhere. And I think they're making progress on that, but they turned their attention um, to, the, uh, to the challenge of, of navigating the pandemic economy and, and, the, and the immediate challenge that they set for themselves was to track the coevolution of the economy and the epidemic and to try to do it globally. Where they are is they're tracking in real time um, uh, 131 or two countries. Um, and, and I'm gonna spend some time showing you the, the, the choices they've made with respect to the graphics and the tracking of that. So that, that's mainly what I wanna do. If, if we have time, I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time on where these digital trends that Marcus referred to uh, before are going, but, but I'm not sure we'll get there. Um, so the, 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 the um, coronavirus pandemic is coming in waves. So the first wave uh, was in basically in Asia, prominently in China, but not exclusively. It then spread more or less to the developed countries um, and now it is, uh, in terms of numbers, it is dominated by a range of emerging economies and developing countries. And the patterns that, you're, uh, that I'm gonna try to show you look somewhat different as you, as you go across these waves. But this is a kind of graphic that indicates kind of where we are. This is fairly up to date, uh, sort of end of June. Uh, and it, th there are variations in this, but the, the, but the evolution of the pandemic economy typically looks something like this. So you have um, a lag of variable magnitude in which the virus is spreading and nobody's noticed, uh, or there hasn't been a confirmed case, or, or, or whatever factors there are that provoke uh, a policy response. And then there's a very, usually a very strong, powerful, powerful response that produces a sharp drop in economic uh, activity and economic contraction. Vis-a-vis um, -vis what Marcus was talking about before, you know, conventional uh, macroeconomic data are, are, are sufficiently out of date, um, given the speed with which this moves, that, that you really need the kind of real-time data if you're gonna have a sense of kind of where you are. What follows from that is a trough in which whatever policies that have been adopted, lockdowns, stay-at-home orders, business closures, sector closures, travel restrictions, and so on are maintained. And then hopefully you get to a point where you feel that, some point, that you've got some kind of control over the virus. In the context of these studies, can, you know, a turning point comes when you have three consecutive days in which the new confirmed cases are exceeded by the recoveries. Um, that, that occurs at various points as you move across economies. So um, some of the, you know, I don't, I'm not gonna try to go through all of the sort of data on these, on these graphs. And then you have a recovery and people debate what this recovery looks like, but for the most part, what we have seen in a very wide range of countries um, including ones that are viewed as successful, is a basically a gradual opening up and a slow but steady movement uh, to the right, uh, which means basically the contraction is getting smaller and the virus is, uh, is getting under increasing control by a metric that I'll describe in a minute. Obviously, a vaccine, if it were pretty much universally available, would truncate this pattern and make at least the end of it look more like a U, but for the moment, it, it looks like this is, this is what's happening. Even here, you can see China has been in this for a long, long time now by, by pandemic standards, and, uh, and that's where they are. Um, 
So the fundamentals of the pandemic economy, I think, are probably f completely familiar to you now. So I just I, w I won't spend a lot of time on this. The 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 uh, policy response essentially produces business closures, mobility restrictions, and sector shutdowns, and simultaneously reduces demand and supply. And then risk aversion, which we don't measure very well uh, and may vary considerably across countries, is a separate sort of drag on demand. Uh, and it's gotten a fair amount of attention, but it probably deserves some more attention um, because it's related to the question of how, how, how safe people feel. Um, if you want to reduce risk, uh, you, you know, you, you probably have three levers. One is to reduce the infection per contact. That's kind of standard, you know, wearing masks and staying a reasonable distance from each other and not being uh, too long in a crowded indoor environment. The second one is open up in such a way that you get the maximum benefit in terms of economic activity per context among other people. So what's that meant? what that's meant is that, you know, in many places, very large gatherings have been ruled out on the ground that the benefit cost ratio uh, in terms of uh, economic uh, recovery are, is relatively low uh, given the increased risk that you occur. The third one I think is really important um, and that is you want to, if you can, you want to reduce the prevalence of the virus among people who are actually in circulation and that's what testing and tracking and isolating um, is all about and that is what the digital tools um, that have been used in various places are all about. Um, so for example, I and mean, many of you know this, but in China right now, uh, and this was introduced early on, virtually everybody is walking around with a, with a color-coded um, health certificate. It's a QR code. Um, if it's green, you can move around in the economy. If it's yellow or red, you basically can't. You can't go in a building or a restaurant. You can't get on the subway or bus. <clears throat> so basically, you are uh, isolated. The, obviously, that's, that is a, uh, uh, a way of restricting the, the spread of the virus, but it's also a way of accelerating the return of economic activity if you can, if you can do it, um, because people um, are less risk averse because they think if the system's working, um, that people they're in contact with have a lower probability of actually being infectious and carrying the virus. Um, and so in that sense, uh, filling in the informational gaps that surround the externalities that Marcus talked about, if, if you can find a way to do it is, uh, is important. On balance, I would say in most of the OECD countries, Europe and America, certainly the vast, the, the, the stance we've taken is we can't solve the, the privacy problem and the distrust of government problem, and certainly not in real time and fast enough. So we've made relatively little use of these digital tools and, uh, and, and, and we're gonna pay some, some kind of price for that. I'm not saying we made the wrong choice and I respect the poll that was just conducted. Okay, um, this I think, you know, as you've probably heard before. So I live in Italy. Italy uh, went into this with a weak economy. Um, we had an enormous invisible spread of the virus, um, which required, once we got the hang of it, um, and especially in the north of Italy, and it, just a massive response. Uh, um, so we were, they shut the schools here in, on, in, on February 23rd, and we were in full lockdown nationwide by early March. Um, and, and we stayed in that basically uh, until almost the end of May and inter-regional travel here was not allowed until the start of June. <clears throat> it's been reasonably successful, but it has produced an enormous negative economic shock um, to the economy. Um, in fact, we probably wouldn't have gotten away with it um, because we went into it with a a sovereign debt to GDP ratio of 130% and it, we're gonna come out of it over 160% by most people's estimates. Um, and that <coughs> takes us back to 2012 and potential instability, but it looks like the European Central Bank has the backing essentially to do what Mario Draghi did before and that is prevent any uh, volatility and instability 
in the sovereign debt markets here, including in the ones that are vulnerable, like the like the Italian one. So that's that's basically kind of where we are. I the unemployment estimates are <coughs> are you know as as Mark has said are are difficult um, to get ac an accurate picture because it moves so fast and they're not comparable across countries. There, the distributional aspects of this are, are I think, important, um, and they're getting more attention now. Um, the, the, oh, there Mike. was a study done at the University of Chicago. Uh, the, Mike, where can the, I just the, ask you about, there's some questions about the risk aversion. So you yes. pointed out three levels where the risk itself, you can control and mitigate it, but the yeah. attitude towards risk, do you think there's a psychological effect to the people that they become more risk averse or more reluctant to take on risk? And that's might be a long lasting impact also on the recovery and the, the future growth path, even after we have left the COVID crisis. Yeah. It might so, be higher. So, What's your take on that? Do you have a take on that? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I think it's a reasonable hypothesis and in absent the experience that would allow us to settle it, I probably, uh, you know, wouldn't bet against it with my kids' savings. Uh, I, I do think there will be long-lasting effects, um, and they will probably spill over into how we work. Um, it, they may spill over into how education works because um, we've got some immediate challenges in opening up in that dimension. But yes, the bottom line is I think. Um, there's a bunch of things that are, are going to be uh, on that agenda. One is, you know, the one you mentioned when you said maybe we'll have to move to the kind of the authoritarian side of that graph, at least for periods when we're under threat like this. But that, I, even that's kind of an open question. And it may get decided differently in, in, in different countries. Um, but I, I don't have any doubt that, that this thing will leave psychological impacts that will affect uh, how people behave. And it'll, all, all, it'll also affect agendas. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't want to overstate this because we're in territory where we, you know, we're guessing. <laughs> Maybe we could call it forecasting, but it seems like guessing right now. But, you know, resilience in multiple dimensions uh, for societies, for countries, for economies, for businesses, it looks like it's going to move up on the priority list for a lot of places, and that and that's related to risk because it it's a, it's in a sense it's a response um, to risk. Uh, and I hope that's partly responsive. But uh, Marcus, um, should I go ahead? Yes, thanks. Oh, but, but just very briefly, I mean, there was a study done um, at the University of Chicago early on in the pandemic, and they basically asked, well if you kind of make an educated guess in the United States, how, how many jobs can be done from home, their answer was 33%. Um, and when you look at it by uh, geography, you get considerable differences. But the most interesting thing to me is if you look at it by sector, you get very, very different answers. So, um, and I don't want you to interpret this as, you know, sort of educational services is way up high in terms of the fraction of jobs that can be <coughs> performed remotely. Uh, it doesn't mean it's ideal. And I don't think anybody who's an educator thinks that, that that's ideal, but you can get by um, in a way you probably couldn't have in 1995. Um, but there are sectors where the estimate is very low. So the bottom, the bottom uh, thing on the left side of this graph is accommodation and food service, or which is normally called um, hospitality sectors, um, where the number that they came up with was 4%. Um, <laughs> That's a sector that has relatively low average incomes for the people who work there. Um, it employs something like 16 to 17 million people in the American economy, and it has basically been put out of work uh, by the sector. So it's, it, 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 none of this is definitive, but I think probably Raj Chetty painted a, a pretty <clears throat> clear picture um, that, you know, the pandemic economy at least before the policies that are designed to buffer and redistribute the shock are, uh, is if it were a tax, it would be, I guess, regressive and maybe even very regressive. Um, I, I, by and large, I think the policies that have been adopted in a wide range of countries are, are well considered. They're, they're, 
this this um, shock is going to cause a very large amount of economic damage in terms of lost income and output, and and that's going to show up on balance sheets. And a lot of these policies are essentially moving that damage to the public sector, to the sovereign balance sheet. Um, and I don't, uh, you know, it's not that anybody thinks it's ideal to have uh, burgeoning public debt, but but it may be better than leaving it lying around in various places in the business sector or failed businesses and in the household sector from the point of view of, of the economy. So my view of that is that, that on balance, on that dimension, they've kind of got it right. Um, so so Mike, the, I, these are the websites. Questions. Yes, so go some ahead. more questions on the on the risk aversion. So Olivier Blanchard makes an important distinction. There might be some risk aversion with respect with respect to contacts, you know, might be very concerned that you meet somebody, but there might be less risk aversion change with respect to the future, the future, how bright the future will look. Uh, do you have a take on this? And this difference seems to be mattering a lot for policy responses, you know, how we set up things, how we respond to certain things, distinguishing between different types of risks, you know, contacts versus future prospect of the whole economy. And, Oh, no, it's, it's a bit, uh, hello, Olivier. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, that's a very fair point. I was referring to risk aversion specifically with respect to um, the infectious part, uh, but but there are other uh, there are other uh, important dimensions. Um, risk aversion with respect to future epidemics like this, or uh, would be one, and probably relates to that resilience agenda. That, that I talked about before. So yes, this is, it is definitely multidimensional. Um, but the part I was talking about, know, one way to describe the part that I was trying to, trying to address, and I apologize if I wasn't clear, is if, you know, if, if, we had, if we had a system like the one that's functioning in China, and I know we can't have it because it violates too many values that are, um, that are important to people. Um, but if we did have that system, then we'd all be yellow, hmm. basically because we have no system for distinguishing people who are in circulation. It's a, it's a, from that point of view, risk aversion inter interacts with the fact that we're operating in a, in a sort of informational desert. Um, and, and the reason we're in that position is we, these externalities either don't exist or don't matter uh, in a normal economy, but, but they do in this one. But I'm happy to talk about that further because it's a very interesting um, but the, do you think that, you know, new technology will reduce the risk aversion with respect to contacting others because we will be way better in five years or in two years even uh, to control this risk or to how to manage this risk? Because well, see that for me, that's an open question. So I don't have any doubt that if we can find a way that makes people comfortable um, to use uh, digital tools that we can reduce the risk and therefore reduce the you know lingering economic impact of of, of of something of a pandemic like this but whether we go in that direction or not i think it's harder to guess uh because the, i mean you don't get very far into the kind of public discussion of this before you read something like a large number of people are very uncomfortable from a privacy point of view right uh, and, I mean, in, in, an, in, in an extreme form, I'm, I'm not saying they're wrong or questioning these values at all. Uh, but for example, you know, what, what do you do if somebody has been tested and, and is tested positive for the virus? Are they free to move around? You know, are, is, there, is it legitimate to track them? Uh, you know, and discover if they're sort of out doing relatively dangerous things with respect to other people or, or not. Th these are questions that, you know, have in the kind of short run have different answers as you look at different countries. You know, so there's lots of countries in the world where you fly in and they ask you for your <coughs> cell phone number and they basically track where you are. And if you've been told um, to uh, isolate yourself for 14 days, um, you know, in various ways, they can either figure out where you are, or they'll phone you and ask you where you are. But, but that we don't do that. And again, I, I, so I'm kind of amb ambiguous on where we're going to go in this. To me, right now, it's an important agenda 
And I think people are kind of hoping this will go away and we don't have to deal with it and we can go back to the things we're comfortable with in value terms, but, but I'm not sure that's a wise choice. Even, even if we go through the difficult exercise of figuring out what temporary and relatively secure uh, methods we can use to mitigate risk in the context of a situation like this. So do you expect, would you stimulate a public debate on this dimension? Should, yes, I would, uh, on who once we get through it. it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it would be, I mean, you can make a long list of things we should probably have a debate on, but uh, yeah, I would put this on it for sure. And essentially okay, let me, measure the, I'll let you go. Okay. No, no, go ahead. No, yeah, yes, but this is what this is about. One part of the public debate would be what are the economic costs if you don't trace somebody. That's right. Because, yeah. You know, you make people more cautious and uh, limit other people's freedoms. Yeah, and I don't think we have enough, you know, well-digested data, but <clears throat> the speed, the, the recovery in China is incomplete and maybe overstated in the graphs I'm about to show you, but there's no question that, um, that, that people's willingness to go back to relatively ordinary economic activity is enhanced by uh, feeling relatively safe. And, 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 and you can collect that anecdotal evidence, but we all can just by talking to friends and ask how do they feel about it. But the risk is still there. Uh, so it's not, I, I, I think it's on the to-do list uh, once we can um, make assessments of which things worked, which ones didn't, how much, I mean, there's basic questions that we can't answer uh, right now, like, you know, what's the, what's the distribution of risk aversion in any given population? There's, there's obviously people, if relieved of uh, very strict and forced uh, rules about behavior in the context of the pandemic, are relatively non-risk averse. You know, they go to crowded places, you can see thousands of them on beaches and stuff like that. I, again, I'm not being critical. Um, it's, it may be even at a more macro level, Marcus, I mean, people, I'm, I'm going to show you things that people are going to be critical of in terms of the American states at the end, if, you know, if we, if we have time, um, in terms of the way the pandemic economy is going. Um, but it may be that some of these states have actually made a different value judgment with respect to the trade-off between uh, controlling the virus and its effects on people's lives on the one hand and the economy on the other. I mean, there's no reason to think everybody's going to make that trade-off in exactly the same way, or countries, or societies. Okay, this, the, these graphs look like this. So there's, there's three dimensions that are interesting. One is um, the, how the economy is doing, and that is measured on the vertical axis by the, an estimate of the contraction. And that estimate comes mainly from mobility data. It's not perfect. Uh, but it seems to account uh, in regressions that these folks have done for a reasonably large, depends on what period of time you use, a reasonably large fraction of the <coughs> variation in you know, relatively short-term flow type economic activity. So it's a, a mobility-based estimate and much of that data globally comes from Google. It's astonishingly detailed. Uh, in any country you look at, some friends of, of mine are doing a study of uh, a very detailed study that's focused on the uh, welfare of migrants in India and they're using the um, state by state uh, mobility data uh, from the from the Google database it's publicly available and it's really useful um, so <coughs> sorry I'm going the wrong way here um, on the horizontal axis you want a measure of how with the progress of the virus the measure they've chosen is um, doubling days of confirmed cases. So basically, if, 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 if the virus, uh, the new confirmed cases are doubling at a relatively, you know, with a big lag, that in other words, if you, you take a point of time and you ask how far back do you go before you get, you, you've gone up by a factor of two um, in the new cases, uh, if that number is very big, you're probably getting the virus under control. And if it's, and if it's around 10, so that it's doubling every 10 days, you know you're in trouble. I mean, and at the start of these things, as you can see from the graphs, you know it's doubling at a much higher rate uh, for most of the economies that got started at this 
at this late. So, so the third dimension that's important is time, and it's hard to put uh, readable graphs in three-dimensional form. So what's happening over, over this, uh, these things is time is moving, but it's not moving uniformly. So there's a tendency for all of us, I think, to try to, th to think of time as on the horizontal axis, but it's not. Um, and if you go to the website where, they do, where you can track virtually any economy, um, if you hover over the graph, you can tell um, you know, where you are in terms of days in, uh, along the path. That matters because the damage that you do depends on not only the magnitude of the contraction initially, but how long you stay there. So an economy that you know, has a big contraction and then moves very rapidly to the right, uh, as well as upwards, in, uh, in one of these graphs is, is doing better than one that has a very big contraction and then sits there you know, in a state uh, where the virus is trying to, you're trying to get the virus under control, but it's not working very well. Um, so in the Chinese case, the movement was quite fast along this line. Um, anyway, I'm gonna, so that's how these things work. Um, and now I'm gonna show you, so this is what they, they call, what we call, I've been trying to help out with this. Um, this is the first wave. So China is this uh, dark blue line, and you can see it was big contraction, estimated contraction, uh, but a relatively quick, very aggressive response and relatively quick control uh, of the virus, followed by, you know, by most people's standards, uh, this, the desired movement is upward and to the right. Uh, so the virus is, is spreading uh, less and less quickly and eventually is turning over because of recoveries. Um, this vertical line is a crude estimate so they asked this, the question, on average, when did the countries that are in recovery actually start experiencing fewer, fewer new cases than recoveries? And the answer is, came in around 18 or 19 days. Having said that, that's an average, and that occurs at, at different points for different economies. So there's a fairly big spread in that. The, the other thing you see on this graph is that South Korea and uh, is, an, is an economy that had a pretty big outbreak, but they got on it very quickly. So there was relatively little lag um, before the reaction came. And that, that turns out to be hugely important. I mean, if there's one lesson from this is that speed really matters in this early stage. So if you, if, if you don't react quickly, you lose the capacity to contain the virus in the conventional testing tracking way. And then you have to, then your only resort is the, the very big lockdowns. And Japan is a kind of hybrid case, um, but the contraction's less there. If you switch to- uh, Mike, go ahead. Concerning, yeah. can you explain the x-axis, doubling days of confirmed cases? Yes. How, how is it exactly defined? So in, on any given day, uh, you ask yourself the question, how, how many days before that day was the, were the new cases half of what they are now? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's how many days from wherever that day was to double to here. So, so let, me, let me give an example. So <clears throat> if you have no new cases, right, on any given day, then the doubling days will go up by one because the, the, new, the, the top, the, the, the new cases, you know, uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm not saying this right. Um, yeah. What, what's the best way to explain this? It's <clears throat> um, these are doubling days of confirmed cases. Okay, not not new cases. Right. Mm -hmm. So, if you're doubling at a very high speed down here, then b basically the virus is out of control because you're adding cases faster than a combination of recoveries. Uh, and as that number gets bigger, uh, you know, so if you, if, you, if you have no cases on a, any, on, a, on a given day, then the doubling days will go up by one, right? Because you, because you basically added a day and you've got the same number of total cases. Is that clear? Yes. I mean, the important thing is that it's not a timeline. It's no, it's not. A t that's it the can crucial go back thing. Back and forth, the graph can go 
back and forth. And that's why for Japan, it was wiggling uh, back and forth. Yeah, well, you're going to see a lot more wiggling in about one minute. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but, but yes, so that takes some mental adjustment. And, and if you go to the website uh, where they're actually doing the tracking, you can, you can follow the timeline for a given, uh, for any collection of countries you want or any given country you're interested in. Um, so you can see if it's happening faster or slower. But, the, but time is, in, the, in these static graphs I'm showing you, is, is suppressed. Uh, these are, uh, you know, just the magnitude of the hit is pretty big in certain sectors. This is data from the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute on kind of, they, this is basically credit card pur purchases in the United States. Um, here's Europe. They chose Sweden, Norway, Austria, or we did, and Italy. Um, so Italy is where I am. So Italy, the virus was uh, spreading essentially invisibly. We now believe starting in November. Uh, and the first response came in February. So we're talking, you know, uh, a, a virus that was large, essentially undetected and spreading for over two months, well over two months um, before uh, the reaction came. The reaction was incredibly strong and it has been largely successful, but, and you can't see it, but, we, we were down here, so we had, it took a month to get to the bottom. <laughs> uh, and now, uh, and then it took another uh, uh, month, roughly, um, to, before the virus started to look like it's under control. This, this, this um, little uh, arrow is recovery phase and it starts when you get those three consecutive days of uh, the, the new cases being exceeded by the recoveries. Uh, so you see different patterns here. Um, Sweden is an outlier and it's very difficult to know how this is gonna, gonna work out. So it's been much talked about in the press and we just don't know uh, whether they're gonna have to clamp down and, uh, and but, they, but their, their strategy was um, much less reduced mobility, less economic contraction. And the question is, are they gonna get the virus under control? Norway is a more conventional case. Austria had a pretty big uh, lockdown as well. This is, um, since we, I didn't have it, I, this is exactly what the, uh, the tracking looks like on the, on the website I, I referred to before, on the URL I gave you before. And if you push this button down here, you can actually see it happening in real time with the dates um, spitting up. So these, again, uh, this is Germany. Uh, quite successful containment uh, with a yeah, large but but you know not enormous economic contraction and uh, pretty steady progress um, and France had a bigger contraction and a bigger outbreak at, at this at the start before they reacted but they're uh, moving forward um, so these are testing rates across different levels of economies um, they by and large they're they're essentially all way too low, except for those few unusual cases I told you about in Asia. Um, and now, I told you, Marcus, you were gonna see wiggles. <laughs> so these are developing countries in various categories. Um, so what you see here is, uh, I mean, the other ones weren't pretty, but, but these are really kind of worrying. So, um, so Argentina, uh, um, you know, has been in this uh, for 102 days, a big drop in, 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 in a big economic contraction. Uh, and they, so they experienced the, the, the economic side of what's supposed to get the virus under control. And, and their doubling days is still in the range, you know, 15 to 20. Uh, and that's not safe. Uh, that's, that's pretty close to the sort of gestation period for the virus, you know, contraction, infectious, it's in, in, in playing out. So the virus is out of control there. Ditto Brazil. Brazil has less contraction. Uh, it's written about all the time, but basically they're, they're, <coughs> um, they haven't backtracked in the way that Argentina did, but they're, but they're struggling to get the virus under control. And they've been in this for uh, 109 days and, and they have not had three consecutive days of, uh, that tends to occur you know, further out. You see the similar pattern in Africa. 
Uh, and so Rwanda actually, which is the dark line here, got control of the virus it, in, in a sense, had a, a fairly extended period in a trough, then started to, on a path that looks, looks like it might have been the path we saw in the OECD countries, and now has been backtracking fairly rapidly. The, the times associated with this are a uh, small number of days, a huge, uh, huge outbreak. Nigeria is, is this one, so they, this, this is a backtrack in here. Uh, and these are, these, are, these are dangerous numbers from the point of view of containment of the virus. And similarly, South Africa, big contraction, uh, starting to move through the trough and then a backtrack. And now after a significant number of days, don't forget this is the third wave, so they're not as far into it as some of the other countries. Um, they look like they're having, I don't know what the right way to describe this is, but a number, a wide range of economies are either stuck or at risk of getting stuck in a, in, in a place where they either have decided to or they have to, because of livelihood considerations, open the economy um, because people can't sustain lockdowns for too long and the fiscal and medical and other resources are limited. And so they're stuck with a virus that's... Um, more like if I look at Rwanda, it seems like when it goes back, the, the economy would didn't suffer from that, but the health situation suffer. And it might be, yeah. it might be suspicious. It's because of higher testing rates. So now, you know, the authorities are testing much more, and that's why we discover more the doubling days is actually are going down. Uh, it, it, can you control a, for that? Does the statistics control for that? How many tests you do and hence you discover more people? As far as I know, the statistics don't control for that. I believe that, I mean, that's a possibility, but I believe the testing rates are by and large in the graphs we're looking at so low that that's not the explanation. The, the reason that you're backtracking is there's an outbreak and it happens so fast that there's, it's, it's not associated with an, an economic opening up. It's just mm -hmm. associated with not containment um, at that level of contraction. I mean, if you take a case like India, um, and I may have that graph. Uh, no, it'll be one further on. Um, yeah. And how much do you take regional aspects into account? There might be a huge outbreak in some region, but yes. it doesn't affect GDP in the whole country so much, but in this but, particular region. Uh, uh, yeah, no, that, no, that you can do. Um, so uh, we have a project that just got started to see if it can be done for India, because India has huge challenges because of the density of the population, and it's clearly not uniform um, across the country. Uh, and so you have big outbreaks in uh, Mumbai and Delhi uh, and a few other uh, large cities, but, but, they're, but, but from the point of view of the previous discussion, you basically see relatively, diff relatively difficult time moving into the, what you call, let me just call it the safe zone with respect to virus containment and a, and a fairly significant increase in mobility which suggests the economy's opening up and without really containing the virus. Vietnam on the other hand uh, is a more conventional case um, probably with uh, different sort of social behavior, different conditions on the ground and more digital um, uh, tools. Yes, so there is regional dif differentiation and, and if, because the mobility data is extremely rich, uh, you can at least take a shot at doing it uh, by even, even by municipality, but certainly by state. Uh, so in the United States, uh, you can do it by state and they've done it. Uh, so this is what that the United States states look like, and this is divided into those that reopened before May 15th, um, and those that, uh, next graph is those that moved uh, after May 15th. So in, in, in this case, you can see these, these are, again, talked about in the press in terms of an outbreak, but you can see the whole pattern. Um, so Florida uh, is, uh, you know, reasonably large contraction, uh, clear outbreak, um, some degree of, uh, you know, sort of control of the virus, then what starts to look like a conventional um, 
progress upward and to the right, reduced economic contraction and, uh, and, uh, and doubling days rising as a kind of index of control of the, of the virus. And then, uh, th then and this, this horizontal part, this backtracking part um, is occurring very quickly. Uh, so, you so know. Mike, uh, Bengt Holmstrom has a question about the Vietnam picture you've shown before. Yeah. Okay, Do you I'll have any back. insights why Vietnam did uh, so well? Is there anything uh, to be said about that? Um, so I not come fully up to date on on the Vietnam situation, but I be, but I believe that their um, their their approach was um, what I can't tell you, uh, Marcus and Bengt is in detail what digital tools and other pieces of information they use to, to, to it as part of their containment. I, I can try to look that up and respond to that because uh, mm -hmm. it shouldn't be too hard to find out. But, but I believe they made extensive use of that. And, but the rest of it is a, is a response that, um, that's similar to China in terms of its aggressiveness, but they caught it earlier, okay? The, the, the single most important lesson from these graphs is if you want a pretty looking graph, which means a lower economic contraction and a more rapid recovery, then you want to start early. Uh, because you have options when you start early that you don't have once you start late. I believe the story, and again, I'll do, I'll do some homework and confirm this, but I believe the story on Vietnam is, even though they didn't catch it immediately, they caught it early enough that they were able to track and isolate uh, and contain using that tool as opposed to the blunt instrument of broad lockdowns and stay-at-home orders and things like that. But so if you look at India, you predict India will go back to close to 100% if you were to predict? So I think, you know, the purpose of this exercise was partly to help um, everybody, but particularly policymakers, you know, in democracies, the people we elect are the only people who have the right to make these very tough choices and trade-offs that are involved in deciding you know, what to do as you move along these paths. Um, I think the question that, you know, that is unanswered is, are, are these economies basically gonna recover with the virus still you know, moving rapidly through parts of the population? Or are they gonna make another serious attempt to incur a bigger economic, another economic hit uh, and and try to get the virus under control. And I don't know the answer to that. Um, and it's not evident in the graphs. I mean, this is the third wave and we, and we really don't know what they're gonna decide. Uh, is it right to view this graphs as a trade-off between health and economy? So if it's downward sloping, there's a trade-off. If it's upward sloping, then there's not. So the focus is on the trade-off between the two forces? On no, even if it's upward sloping, there's trade-offs that are being made all the way along um, that have to do with this, this sort of extent and sequencing of the opening up process while you're monitoring the progress of but the if virus. It's, if it's upward yeah. sloping, the doubling days is increasing, which is good, and the economy is recovering, which is also That's good. Right. So, 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 you know, so, so yeah. it's unambiguously true uh, the following things are unambiguously true. A smaller contraction is better, initial contraction is better than a bigger one. An early response is better than a late response because you can get it under control. And movement upward to the right is, is good and the faster the better, provided you don't backtrack. All of those things are true. Thanks. But, but it does look like in the case of India, I mean, it, it, it's obvious, it, you know, if, you, if we put ourselves in the position of the, the Indian policymakers at both the, cent, you know, the central federal level and the state level, these are very difficult choices. There are several million migrants who had livelihood problems with the lockdown who basically started moving back to, you know, their home state. Uh, and that's obviously problematic, but it may, it may be, uh, you know, it, in humanitarian terms, it's very tough, but, but it doesn't tell you what the optimal policy responses are. But, but what worries me is that uh, countries are finding it very difficult with sustainable economic contractions, meaning sustainable for a long enough period to get the virus under control, or are having trouble getting the virus under control. Uh, I mean, these numbers are very small. So South Africa 
you know, if, if you're in the 10 to 15 uh, doubling day range, the, the virus is, is clearly out of control. Um, so it's, and I think a number of the poorer countries, I mean, the, the international community has concluded that a combination of low fiscal capacity, low medical capacity, and other factors that make this difficult that, that an international effort to, to uh, support these economies or as they proceed through this pandemic economy is, is, is really important. Um, if you force me to guess, um, I would say in the poorer economies, the, the draconian choice they will face is, is, has to do with the inability to log, the inability to sustain an economic contraction for too long, being forced to not do it, and having, um, and having a, uh, a, a pandemic, uh, domestic pandemic that's uh, in human terms way larger than, than anybody would like to see. But that's a guess. I mean, we don't, we don't know yet where we're going. Um, so that's what, and if you look at the, so the American state, there's a number of American states that have kind of lost control of this. I think the explanations for this are, um, well, everybody has their own, but I mean, you can't explain it in terms of the constraints that, uh, that a number of developing countries and emerging economies face. So you, I think you have to explain it um, in, in terms of, you know, real choices. Um, I, I, I try to be very careful not to second guess. Um, I'm not the elected official that's supposed to, uh, you know, decide these things, but, but it looks very much like the opening up process here was sufficiently quick that, uh, uh, and the social distancing and, and all that was sufficiently quick to, to produce this backtracking effect. It's, it's very clear in the data. So what they're going to do now, I mean, the initial indications are they're going to, you know, tighten the restrictions again. And, and start trying to go the other way. We'll see. Uh, it's, it's not a done deal. Now, my main American home is in Florida. Uh, Florida has you know, moved very rapidly in the last couple of weeks toward uh, an outbreak that's out of control. Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, this is the reopening since the May 15th. So the, these are mostly the early cases, uh, Washington, classic pattern, New York, very big contraction, uh, but, but virus under control. Uh, Minnesota, less so, but similar with some odd backtracking in the middle. Uh, but Arizona uh, is, 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 is showing the pattern of the, that we saw in the previous graph, the very rapid backtracking. So you can read about this in the paper, but uh, this is probably not what the path you want to be on. Um, Dave Brady and I, I'll, I'll finish with this because I don't think we'll have time to spend um, talking about the digital, maybe another time. <laughs> digital uh, well, we adoption We can take another three, four minutes. So. Okay. Wait, uh, Dave Brady and I were, have been trying to figure out, you know, there's lots of data that Dave is a political scientist at the uh, at Stanford and a friend and colleague. Um, and so we occasionally get together and try to kind of put together the political economy um, side of this with, with uh, the, the politics and the economics. And so there's a, a very sort of widespread pattern of lack of trust in uh, government and other institutions. It varies a bit from country to country, but it's startlingly widespread. If you look over 2015 to 2000 until the present, uh, you know, you don't get a downward trend, but you just get very low numbers in terms of high levels of trust. Um, <clears throat> ironically, uh, across a wide range of countries, uh, the institutions that were with the show up in the survey data as most trusted are the police <laughs> and the military. Um, anyway, so what this, what we did is just, it, it, it's quick and dirty, but there's a YouGov poll that asks the question, how, how's your government doing in handling the pandemic economy? Uh, and so here's some data. You can see the Australians started out okay and we're getting pretty good marks. Uh, the UK has kind of been up and down, but they're not, you know, it isn't a huge hit now. 
Um, and Mexico is, is similar. It's, it's not, uh, again, I, I don't want to generalize. Canada uh, is sustained pretty high level of approval. The United States is down here, so it's similar to the early ones in, alongside Mexico. Um, bottom line is, <coughs> the, at least for some countries, the, um, the performance during the pandemic economy uh, gets rated higher in these surveys than the ratings that you do just in general about how's, how's it going, how's the government doing, is it a trusted institution, et cetera. So it, it, I just find it interesting uh, that, that, uh, that there's a fairly wide variation and at least some countries come out better, uh, not b better than they do on the standard questions. Um, then here's Italy, surprisingly, you know, we, <laughs> I, I'm, I have to resist being impolite here, but Italy is not famous for having a uh, highly popular, stable government. But on the whole, um, they're getting pretty high marks for the way they've responded to this. Now, you know, we're entering the recovery period, so there's another batch of uh, challenges to be faced, and and they're going to. It's going to be an uphill battle. This is a country that is heavily dependent on tourism. You know. Both Canadian and Americans and Chinese are not allowed to come here. In fact, they're not allowed to come to Europe. Uh, so, you know, it's an uphill battle. Um, Germany's government is, uh, after a slightly slow start, is doing pretty well. Um, and Spain and France are down a bit. So and anyway, it just gives you a flavor of the fact that, you know, the, how people feel about the, the response varies from country to country. Um, Marcus, this is um, a kind of transition. These are these are digital company gra graphs, but I think given the time, it's probably better if I stop there and, uh, and see if I can respond to comments or answer questions. Yeah, so there's a couple of questions I would like to, so this trust issue came up early also in the questions, uh, trust in the government by Jana. Uh, what she would like to know, do you see a connection between risk aversion and trust? So in a sense that if you trust your government a lot, you might be less worried going down the road uh, and hence there's less risk aversion spiking as well. And this might be helpful down the road. Did you look at yes. that? And mm -hmm. the second question on concerning trust was at the starting point of the trust level, do you see that governments which have much more trust reacted differently uh, to how to manage the crisis compared to governments which were had a, a very weak trust level in a sense and they have had less room to maneuver not just only fiscal space matters but also the trust in the government matters so trust space in a sense yeah uh, they're, they're very good questions i mean on that second point um, you know I, it, it's worth careful study so i don't i don't want to sort of wing it too much but but if i take a guess I mean, my sense is on, on, from what i've seen so far you know, in, in looking at things like the things Dave Brady and I looked at, is the correlation between uh, trust in general and the evaluation of the government's performance is not very high. You know, it looks like this is the, the, uh, an outlier. I mean, the reaction to the, the government's uh, handling of the virus. On, on risk aversion, um, and trust, I, you know, I, I think that's actually uh, pretty important, um, but it's tied up with, with other things. So, uh, you know, the, the, the question is, is, if the government tells you um, that, A, that in order to be, uh, to protect the most vulnerable people, we need to behave in the following way, um, which many governments have said. I mean, because of these externalities, uh, people my age apparently are kind of highly vulnerable. Um, it, it looks like people react to that very differently. And I wouldn't be surprised if that did, did turn out to be highly correlated with some kind of generalized trust in, in government. Um, the other thing is, we've stumbled on this before, is do you trust the government to handle your data well so that you can use the data as a virus containment policy? And the answer to that is probably not in a large number of countries for whatever reason, security, or they'll misuse it, or 
they'll t say it's temporary and then it will turn into a permanent condition that we're not willing to tolerate or any one of a number of scenarios that make people uncomfortable. But, but that, has, that has real consequences. Uh, the inability to, to use uh, health data, uh, trust government and make self, accurate self-reporting data on your, your health condition and who you've seen. Uh, they're just, they're big effects and they're enormous differences across countries. Uh, I mean, here in Italy, for example, um, people were asked the question, you know, uh, uh, would you, uh, in, in most of the Western world, um, the, whether you sign up to an app that is supposed to be helpful socially, but also to you um, in dealing with risk um, is voluntary. So they asked people in a number of countries, including this one, you know, are you going to sign up for the app? And about two thirds of the people said, no way. Well, the app isn't very useful. You know, if you get a biased sample that consists of the third of the people who think it's a good, a good idea. Uh, so I, you know, to go back to a question Marcus answered, asked earlier, I, I think all of these issues, you know, about freedom, uh, privacy, and other things, we're going to have to re revisit in a thoughtful, systematic way, understanding that uh, that the old world we live in is sometimes different, and these externalities are really quite big. Thanks a lot. Let me just ask you one more question, and then we end always with a positive note in this okay. webinar series. So okay. you've given us some positive uh, aspect of the current crisis. Um, do you see, you have studied, looked at a lot of the political implications. Do you see, you know, a movement away from the fringes towards the middle and towards more coordination, or do you see a movement towards the fringes? Uh, in various countries you see, for example, in Germany, the the RFD has gained a lot, uh, has lost a lot on uh, you know, followerships and, and the middle gained a lot. Uh, in yeah. other countries might be other. Do you have any take on, on this political perspectives working with your political scientist friends? And then please add a positive note um, to the end. Um, so I think it's, a, it's reasonable to hypothesize that one of the impacts of this might be um, a, a, an appreciation, um, um, how do I say it? An appreciation of government that's practical and gets things done. Um, and, 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 and a somewhat a sort of upweighting that and downweighting something that's ideological, you know, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, populism from the right or the left. I mean, I just think people are going to say, well, you know, in conditions like this, you, 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 you want a government that, that gets the job done. It may not be painful and, or it may be painful and they may have to make sort of some tough decisions and we may not like all those decisions, uh, but, but, uh, but that matters. I mean, let me give you an example. I mean, so I think the federal government did the right thing and passed an absolutely enormous um, kind of fiscal package and then added to it. Um, and, and, but implementation really matters. So unemployment and implementation, you know, insurance is implemented at the level of states. And there's, in the press, there's lots of examples of states who, you know, normally had, you know, a few tens of thousands of applications a week and going to, you know, a few hundreds of thousands in a week and their systems broke down, right? And so, I mean, I think what's, you know, so we can fix that. I mean, that's not, you know, cloud computing actually works if, if you take advantage of it. Uh, but, but I think my guess, Marcus, is people are going to say, okay, you know, ideological differences matter and we, di we disagree with each other, but I really like a government when the push comes to shove kind of gets the job done, whatever that job is. And, and I think that in a sense, that's movement toward the center. On the international front, I, I'm somewhat more pessimistic. I mean, the good news is I think this, that our community, scientists, every, you know, people, epidemiologists, doctors, everybody who has anything useful to say is in full communication with each other and basically is ignoring uh, all of the divisions and tensions. That, and, and that's a good thing. We've always been like that. And that doesn't seem to have broken down. 
Um, but beyond that, I mean, it, I, I guess the jury's out on whether we've had the kind of international cooperation that would have been ideal in the face of a very large challenge like this. Uh, I mean, I, 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 there's a positive and negative to that. Okay. So let's leave it at this balanced view, uh, positive and negatives. Uh, thanks a lot, Mike. It was fascinating to get your perspective and also get these new graphs. And I hope everybody can check out now online these figures as they evolve over time and as they build uh, into the future. Uh, thanks again and hope to Thank see you, you soon Marcus. in the real world and stay safe in Italy. And <laughs> Italy seems to be safer these days than uh, certain states in the United States. Yeah, thanks, it's a, Mike. a reversal. Bye -bye. Thanks, Marcus. Bye-bye.